Dear gracious Heavenly Father, you see your children, the children that you died on the cross for, the children that you have plans for. You are a God of fresh new starts and brand new beginnings, and we can, we can truly be born again today. We can open our hearts and say, Lord, I've drifted. I've not been connected with you. I've been so preoccupied with everything else in my life that you have been at the very bottom of my list. Maybe, you, maybe for some of you, he's not even been on your list. But Lord, I ask now that we would move you to the top, the front and center. And every hand that was lifted today, Lord, there is a burden. It may be them individually. It could be a spouse, a child, a grandchild. It could be a financial situation. It could be a health challenge. It could be um, our spiritual apathy. It could be we're struggling mentally. Multiple things, Lord. You know what the need is. And you, you, are, you are a prayer-hearing God and I praise you that we can stand and kneel before you today and say thank you for being the author and the finisher of my faith. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to start over, to wipe that slate clean, and to trust in you completely. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hello, church family. Man, wasn't that sweet? That was so sweet. Good to see each one of you. Yeah, praise God. We've got a big house full of day, full of Jesus smiles. It's okay to smile for Jesus, right? Yeah. Open up your Bible. You bring your sword. It might be on your phone, but that's okay. Beat us there. Let's go. Let's go. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. This late hour we live in. Ooh. This late hour we live in, it is time to get right with Jesus, isn't it? It really is. You know, I want to talk to you about uh, probably the single most topic in the Bible. I, I, believe, that, I believe that it is. You know, there are lot, there's lots of important topics in the Bible. And us Christians, we like to debate them, don't we? We had some good debating going on this morning, didn't we, Stacy? But this topic that we're going to talk about today, we've got to get right. We've got to get this one right here. Are you? Are you born again? Are you born again? You know, as a pastor, this is what weighs on my heart more than anything else. I know, you know, we're, we're good Adventists. You know, we, we, we know our Bible. We, we, we've got religion down. You know, we, we've got, we're good at this. You know, we're really good at it. But are we born again? You know, this, is, this is a big concern. In John chapter 2, verse 23, verse 23, picking up in verse 23, read with me. Picture this. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Amen. So the Bible says that a, that a great crowd was following Jesus. They wanted to keep following him. They wanted to keep following him, is the picture we get here. But Jesus said no. Jesus said no. What? Why? Because he knew what was in their heart. He knew what was inside of them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, today, we give you permission to search our heart. We don't know ourselves like you do, Lord. We're here. We're here seeking you. But, Lord, you're going to have to reveal what's inside of us. We pray for the Holy Spirit to work in our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, this is so important right here. This is so important. You know, according to what we just read, you can say 
that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. But he might not look at you as one. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourself. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? In other words, examine yourself. Does Jesus really live in your heart? Is He really Lord of your life? Is He really? You know, am I really following Christ? Or am I just going through the motions? Am I just part of religion? You know, the Bible says, the Bible says many, many are going to be deceived by what we're talking about right now. And I love you too much as a pastor. I would not be worth my salt if I didn't talk about this. I wouldn't be. If I say I love you and I don't share exactly what Jesus shared over and over in the Bible, he, he says the word many. Now I want you to go, let's turn in your Bible to, to the Beatitudes. You know, in the Beatitudes, it was almost like Jesus was trying to, to, to kind of straighten it out a little bit. They had lost sight. The people of God had lost sight of who God was. They had. They had got caught up in religion. Religion became their salvation. Is what had happened there. So in the Beatitudes, Jesus just kind of straightens it all out. He, he just he puts, a, he puts some color to it. He, he paints it. He brings it a little bit closer to home to him. And so in, I, I want to read from you uh, in John chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 7 in verse 13 and, and 14. This is what Jesus says. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, there that word many is, many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Now friends, this is Jesus talking here. This is Jesus, the one that loved them, that cared about them. He wasn't trying to beat them up here. He, he was, this, was, this, was, this was like a loving parent talking to his children here is, is what he says here. And then drop on down to verse 21. 21. He says, and I could just hear him, uh, probably tears in his, in his voice almost. He was saying, not everyone, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of God. My Father who is in heaven. Many, there's that word many again. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Many. That, that, that word many. Many is too many. Many is too many. And, 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 he, and he's saying, and these are the workers in the church. I mean, what about the ones that, that just are not really involved in anything? How many of them is many? Many. Friends, eternity is too long to get this wrong. It really is. It's too long to get this wrong. We've got to get this right here. And Jesus is telling us here that we need to examine ourselves. We need to check our heart. We, we, can't, we can't trust our heart. We need to check our heart here. You know, you can't trust yourself. There, there can't be any more important question than than when you ask yourself that question. And this has to be between you and God. Between you and God. There, th we only get to live this life once. There is no second chances in the Bible. Why would Jesus make such a big deal out of this? 
Why would you see him teaching this over and over in the scriptures? Because he knows what's in the heart of man. He knows what's in the heart of man. You don't. But he does. He knows what's in the heart of man. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, in verse 9, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. That was what was wrong with the Old Covenant that we studied about this morning. Our heart is deceitful continually. And, and Jesus loves us too much. He loves us too much to not reveal that to us. To, to open our eyes. That we, that we have no righteousness apart from Jesus Christ. Zero. He loves us too much. We've all been bit by the serpent. Every one of us. We've been bit. The wages of sin is death. We have failed. So go with me to John chapter 3. Flip on over. John chapter 3. We're going to dig in here. Now I've told you the bad news. Now the good news. Amen? Now the good news. John chapter 3. There's no other place in the Bible where step by step Jesus reveals the steps necessary to be born again. You'll not find any other place in the Bible more clear than this. Spend a lot of time there meditating on this scripture, thinking about this. John chapter 3, verse 1. And I'll be reading through verse 7. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, Verily, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of the water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus wasn't an ordinary guy. Nicodemus was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a teacher. He knew the law. He knew the Bible. He, he was good at religion. As a matter of fact, any church should be proud to have Nic Nicodemus as the head elder of that church. By far. The head elder. You know, this, this guy, Pharisees, to be a Pharisee, you had to, they say you had to have memorized the first five books of the Bible. I imagine that's something, you know, that y'all did a few times, right? But you're like me, you keep forgetting it, so you got to keep doing it. Yeah, and they fasted two times a day. I mean, two times a week. Two times a week. I had to think about that. That's pretty serious. They, he was a member of the church. He was a Sabbath keeper. He tithed. And he believed in the one true God. But even still, even still, Jesus says in verse 3, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You must be born again. I think a key that helped me understand this, this passage, is, is, is in the original language. The Greek is, is, you must be born from above this time. 
You must be born from above. This can't be anything that, that of your doing or man's doing. It has to be God's doing. Now, let's bring this a little bit closer to home. So, so we can relate to this. You, you get, unless you are born again, unless God from above, unless something from above, unless the God, the Spirit of God from above is working in you, you get no benefit from the Bible. Amen. Yeah, I don't, it don't do anything for me when you're that way. It's, it, when, when you're not, when, when, when the Spirit of God, when you're not allowing the Spirit of God to move in your heart, it, the Bible, reading the Bible, is going to be boring. It's just, it's just, it's going to be something that you just don't really have time to do because it's just not doing anything for you. It's, it's just more of an intellectual uh, kind of more like a history book in a, in a way. So you have no real desire to even pick up the Word of God and get into the Word of God. You hear other people doing it. You see other people getting emotional at church and, and their hearts touched, but it just don't seem to faze you and you don't know why. You must be born again. Something's got to happen from above. You, you try to be good. You, you go to church. But it's so hard to be a Christian apart from Jesus Christ. We've got to have help from above. That was Nicodemus' problem. He knew. He knew everything. He knew all the fundamentals. He had them down. He taught them to people. But it was all right here. It was here. And Jesus is saying, something has got to happen in your heart, Nicodemus, for it to go from right here to right here. Do you want it? Prince, God's not going to make it hard. Do you want it? You know, and so verse 6, he says, he says, how can somebody... He says, how can, some, how can someone be born when they're old? You can't go back into your mother's womb. Now, I want, do you see the problem here? Do you see the problem already with Nicodemus? What he's doing right here? He's trying to understand spiritual truths, truths from a carnal perspective. Right? That's what, he's, that's what he's trying to do here. You can't do it. You can't do it. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Come on, Nicodemus, I'm telling you again here. Now, I want to make a big point right here because there's a lot of people that, that just kind of, well, a, a lot of people believe that the way you're born again is to get yourself baptized. But how many of you know baptism won't save you? Yeah. You know what? I was baptized when I was 13. And I lived like the devil for 27 years. It didn't work for me. And I know a lot of you know a lot of people that baptism didn't work any for them either. You know why you can tell? Because there's no change. There's no change in their life. There's no fruit. Jesus says you know them by their fruit. There's no fruit. You know, if I thought baptism would work, if I thought baptism would work, I'd put my buddy Ron at the door and wouldn't let anybody out. <laughs> Y'all seen Ron? He's a big guy. But he's got a big heart. Uh, I, and and, and we would, we'd bring Bob's cattle tank in here and we'd fill it full of water and we would baptize and rebaptize everyone here. And some of you, I might have to hold under the water a little bit longer than others. <laughs> water baptism is not going to change you. If you, if, you, if you are not born again, 
If you have not allowed the Spirit of God to come into your heart and work in your heart, when you will go, you will be go into the water a dry sinner and you will come back up a wet sinner. It's just that simple, really. Now, I'm not saying baptism is not important because baptism is very, 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 very important because it's one of the signs. It's one of the ways that we let the world know that we belong to Jesus Christ. That's right. If baptism is, and we've got, we've got some baptismal candidates today here that I am very, very proud of that's making that decision. Something's happened in their life. And they have fell in love with Jesus. And they want to surrender Him and let Jesus be the Lord of their life. And I praise God for them. And, that, and that's Paxton and Bella and Ashlyn, Ryan, and Elijah. And uh, we're, we're going to have these baptisms this afternoon. At 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock at Flint Creek. Pray for the pastor. It's going to be cold. <laughs> but I can handle it. They can handle it. We're, go we're going to do this. So baptism is simply an outward expression of an inward change that's taking place in your life. That's what, it, that's what it means. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture that the old man is dead. And he's going into the watery grave. And, he's, and he goes in the watery grave and he comes back up and he's living for Jesus. What a beautiful picture that baptism is. Jesus says in verse 6, Flesh, Nicodemus, only gives birth to flesh. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of God gives birth to the Spirit. And what Jesus is talking about here, we try to make this complicated, but Jesus is just talking about two births. He's talking about two births. You, you got to be born twice. Once by your mom and next by God through His Spirit. So, so Jesus is saying, to enter the kingdom of God, Nick, you've got to be spiritually born from above. Your first birth, you had no choice. It could have even been an accident. But, the second one is no accident at all. You're not going to accidentally be born again. Because this is something that you've got to do yourself. This is something that you've got to realize. You know what? There's a, there's a missing piece of the puzzle in my heart. And I know what it is. It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. And there must come a time in your life when you make a choice to ask Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior. I don't care if you are the elder in this church. I don't care if you're the president of the general conference, like Nicodemus might have been shooting for. You must be born again, and you have got to ask Jesus personally into your heart and be Lord and Savior, and it has got to be a real deal. This can't be an intellectual ascent. It's not enough to know about God. You've got to know God personally. It's not enough to know that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. You've got to know Him as your personal Lord and Savior. And He's got to live in your heart. And when He lives in your heart, you'll know He's living in your heart. It'll have an effect on your life. This is radical. You know, it, you, you, Jesus says you, you might... It's kind of like he used the wind. He said, you might not know, because some of you might not know for sure when you were born again, but you'll know there's been a change, and you'll know that it's from above, because it will radically change your life. It, it, would, it would do that. It, 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 would, it would do that. And it, Jesus used the wind. He said, you might not be able to, to see the wind, but you can see the effects of it. I remember when Cindy and I were studying the Bible, and God was starting to do something in my life personally, you know, I said, I said, I just don't know if, if, if there's really that much going on. Of course, I was just digging here. And she said, are you, her jaw dropped, are you serious? There's been a big change in you. Yeah, right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. But, but, but there, there is a change in direction in your life. There'll be a change in direction. It, you know, every one of us, Every single one of us in this room was born going the wrong direction. 
Every single one of us, born going the wrong direction. And when you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, when you invite Him into your heart, He changes the want to. He changes the want to, is what, is what He does. You know, before Jesus, I did the, before Jesus came into my life, I did the things that I want to do, wanted to do. I wanted to do all those things that I did. I did it because I wanted to do it. But you know what? After Jesus Christ came into my life, I don't want to do the things I used to do. I don't want to go the places I used to go. I don't want to think about the things I used to think about. Praise God. That was Jesus doing that in my heart. You know, I hate the things that I used to do. I'm embarrassed about the things that I used to do. The only reason I share the things that I used to do is for the glory of God. And so some of you might hear and say, you know what? If he helped that scoundrel, he can help me too. That's the only reason. I, had a, I, I, I was visiting a, a, a very close relative the other day and he said, I don't know if I told everything you told. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to tell you. It's embarrassing. But if it saves one person to get into the kingdom, I'm willing to share it. Amen. What Jesus Christ has done in my life. Praise God. I don't want to do there. There is a power from above working in me now. Working in my heart. A power convicting me of sin. Convicting me. You know, there's no fun anymore sinning. There's no fun in it. I tell you what, I, I get, I, and I do, every once in a while I fall and I say something, I go, oh boy, I get convicted by it and I wish I hadn't said that. And, and you know, there's no fun in it no more. Because that's the Holy Spirit. There is work from above. There's something from above working in my heart. See, when the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, there will be a transformation. There will be something working in your heart that you know that it's got to be God. By this time, finally, Nick was about to bust. He's going, he's going, oh, how? How can this be? How can this be? Because I believe the Spirit of God was burning in his heart like I hope it's burning in your heart right now. I, I, I believe, and he says, how can this be? And, and Jesus, Jesus kind of, he says, now, you, you are a teacher, and you don't know this? He said, you should know this, Nicodemus. I mean, you know the Scriptures. You know, you know Ezekiel chapter 36. Verse 26 and 27, where God promises us that He will give us a new heart and He will give us a new spirit. This is in the Scriptures, Nicodemus. You know, if I will take away your stony heart and I, and I will give you my spirit. He knew these. And, 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 and he, he knew Psalms 51. He'd, he'd recited that since he was probably a little kid. You know, he recited that. Create in me a new heart, oh God. How does it happen, Stacy? God does it. He's the one that's going to make us a, a kingdom of priesthood. It's 100% His work working in us. It's Him doing everything completely, 100%. You know this, Nicodemus. But then he says, he says, so let me remind you. Let me remind you, Nicodemus, and please, this, we all been bit by the serpent. This is the only antidote that I'm going to share with you right now. So if you've missed anything, don't miss the rest of this, okay? Don't miss the rest of this, no matter what your age is. He tells Nicodemus, I'm going to remind you here, just as Moses lifted up the snake, the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in Him may have eternal life in him. Nicodemus knew what he was talking about. He was talking about Numbers 21. Do, do y'all recall Numbers 21, the story? The children of Israel out in the desert, stiff-necked, hard-headed. God was trying to teach them how to have faith and how to have confidence in him. He had worked one miracle right after another in their life. I mean, I mean he, he'd watched the... Pharaoh and his army, being just, they'd watched them be destroyed. They'd watched the Red Sea part. They, they'd, watch wa uh, they'd watch water come out of a rock. They'd watch manna come down from heaven. They'd seen all these miracles from God. And they were still complaining, complaining, complaining. And, and 
And it, God allowed him. He said, okay, let these fiery serpents come into, into the camp. And they started biting everybody. And they were dying. And so they ran to God. He said, ran to Moses and said, oh, cry out to God for us. Cry out to God for us. And God instructed Moses to make a brass image of that snake, of that serpent, and put it up on the pole in the middle of camp. And he told them, very simply, you can either look and live or not look and die. Look. Look and live. Of course, we know this all pointed toward Jesus Christ dying for us on the cross of Calvary. It all pointed toward Jesus. There was no other way. We could never have done it. We could never fulfill the first covenant. It was impossible, humanly impossible. God knew that, but He was showing us because we are so hard-headed. We have got to have God. We have got to have help from above. We cannot do it apart from Jesus Christ. There is no other way that we can do it apart from Jesus Christ. There is no other way. John the Baptist nailed it in John chapter 1 in verse 29. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. There's something about beholding Him. There's something about looking to Him. There's something about taking your eyes off the world and opening up the Word of God and meditating on the Word of God, what Jesus Christ did for you. He took your place. He took your bullet. He died your death. Behold the Lamb of God. And Jesus said it, talking about His own death in John chapter 12 and verse 32. He says, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men into me. There is no other way. There is no other way. If, if you have lost your fire, there, if you're sitting here now and you've lost your zeal for God, you've lost your fire for God and you know it, you've not told anything else, anyone else about it, there is no other way to get that fire back than, than beholding Jesus Christ up on the cross dying for you. If, if you are a Laodicea, nobody would even know it if you were because when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. But if you are in Laodicea, there is no other way to draw you out of Laodicea other than the Word of God. If Jesus Christ, behold the Lamb of God. There is no, If you're in Babylon, we think all of our friends are in Babylon, but we're not in Babylon. Uh, yeah, uh, there is no other way to draw someone out of Babylon other than to point them to Jesus Christ. Dying for you. God loves you so much that He died for you on the cross. He cares about you. And once they fall in love with Jesus, friends, you can step back out of the way and just give them the Word of God and they'll take it from there through the Holy Spirit working in them. I want to encourage each one of you to spend a thoughtful hour every day meditating on the life of Christ, especially the closing hours between Gethsemane and the cross. It will do something to you deep inside. It'll do something to you that you know is... Is, is God working in your heart from above? See, in the second birth, God does it all. He does it all. Our job is to look. Our job is to behold Him. Our job is to behold His love. Jesus Christ dying for me. He does the drawing. We do the looking. Right? Right? But we've got to look. And you know, that's pretty hard. That's not easy with all these serpents all around us. All these fiery serpents. There's so many distractions all around us. There's so many things that get our attention every day. We've got all these things over here and over here. And we get so distracted. We get so busy that we don't take the time to look. We just get wrapped up on our little rat wheel. On the little the racing around the world and life is flying right by us and we're not spending time with Jesus. We're not spending time looking. He says, look, look. Friends, you see, we're broken. We're bent on going a different direction from God. Every single one of us. We're bent on looking the other way. The only thing that will break through the human heart is God's love. It's the only way. There's only one cure. And here it is right here. The cross is the pulpit that God used to preach His love to the world. Have you heard Him preaching? 
Does it make sense? No. But Jesus says this is the way. You know, it didn't, it didn't seem like a, the way to the Israelites, but the ones that looked live. Paul got this. Paul, another one of those Pharisees, right? Another one of those that, that, that knew the religion. He knew the law. Paul got it. He had a, he had a Damascus Road experience. Right? What each one of us need. In, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. Those that are wrapped up in the world. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Wow. Look and live. Look and live. Jesus has promised you it will save you. And Jesus is a promise keeper. He cannot lie. Now, in closing, I, I'm not trying to scare you. This, is, this was not intended to be a scare message. I don't believe in preaching scare messages. I believe it's the love of God that draws you. This is good news. I have shared good news with you today. Jesus wants to give you life. And he wants to give you life in abundance. Beyond what I, I thought I was living it up. I had a terrible life looking back on it now. I love my life now that I've given my life to Jesus Christ. He really is the truth. He really is the life. He really is the way. You know, if, you, if you've been struggling, you know, trying to be a Christian, and it's just wearing you out, and you have no real joy, and you have no peace, and you have no hope, and, it, and if you're afraid to talk to other people about Jesus, Maybe you need some help from above. Maybe, maybe you've been a Christian a long time, but you've just kind of fell in the ditch. Kind of got off that straight and narrow road. It could happen to anybody. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus and live. That's all you got to do. Look to Jesus and live. Maybe you've drifted away. Maybe you've drifted a long, long, long away. Maybe you have fell into some sin that's just got a grip on you. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Come to Him. There, in, in Numbers 21, there's no stipulations. There's no... There's, you know, maybe you fell again and again and again. And, you, and, you, and you're thinking, you know what? Jesus is getting tired of me. I'm just, I, I'm so fake and you just feel so beat up and discouraged. Look to Jesus. Right now, look. Look to Jesus. In Numbers 21, it didn't say anything like, if you've been playing with snakes, some people like to do that, uh, if you, and, and you've got bit again, I'm not going to hear it. That's not what it said. It said, look. Look, look, right where you are, come as you are. I used to think I had to straighten my life up before I could come to Jesus. The Bible, the Bible says, Can an Ethiopian change his skin color, a leopard change his spot? Neither can he that's accustomed to doing evil do good. You've got to come to Jesus right where you are. Right where you are in your life, look. Look, right where you are. Jesus has promised this to be the cure, your cure. He's promised it. He's promised it. Has, and I pray so. Has anybody felt the wind blowing on their heart today? I pray you have. I have been in much prayer about this message. In much conviction about this message here today. I don't believe it's an accident that you're here today. 
each and every one of you. Now, I don't want anyone, I don't want anyone to leave here today without the confidence, knowing in your heart that you have been born again. Jesus doesn't want to make this hard. You look to Him. You come as you are and you look to Him. Don't try to straighten up and then look. You look right now. You look the way you are. Now, we're at Springtown. We're all in this together, right? We all want all of us to make it to heaven, right? So I'm going to ask you all to do something. I'm going to ask you to bow your head right now. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Bow your head and close your eyes. And I want you to lift up a little prayer to yourself. It's between you and God. And I want you to ask God to forgive you your sins. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And I need you in my life to be my Savior. Forgive me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I don't want anything between me and my Savior. Now, there's going to be some here that's maybe never given their life to Jesus Christ. You've never given your life to Him. You've never asked Him to be Lord of your heart. I want to, I want to ask you, for your sake, to raise your hand. To raise your hand right now. Maybe, maybe right now that you're a member of this church or some other church and you've been a member a long time. You've been a member a long time. Maybe you was baptized many years ago, but you know that you have drifted away. Jesus does not want you to walk out of this church without making things right with Him. And you can do it today. The blood of Jesus will cover your past. Every bit of it. His grace is bigger than your sin. His grace is bigger than your past. Raise your hands. I want to be born again. I want to be right with you, Lord. I want to be right. I want to put the past in the past. I want to walk out here clean, knowing that I'm right with you. I want to be right. Praise God. Father in heaven, Lord, I want to lift each one of my brothers and sisters up to you right now. And I pray that the, that the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary could be applied to each one of them. You know their heart. I don't know their heart, Lord. I just know you. My faith is in you. And I know what you went through to save each one of us. So, Father, I pray that the wind of the Holy Spirit would blow in each one of the hearts here. And that you would let not one person walk out this door without being right with you. I thank you for that. I thank you for the power from above. That this is not anything we can do, but this is something you do. Thank you, dear God. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I'd like to, we've got a couple baptisms. Praise the Lord. This afternoon, 2 o'clock, Paxton is going to be baptized at Flint Creek. You're welcome to come and join us to be a part of that. At 5 o'clock, we got Bella. Bella and Ashland. I don't know where they're at. Ryan, uh, they're around there somewhere in Elijah at 5 o'clock. Please be in prayer for them. Please be in prayer. God bless you. I love you. Jesus loves you.